This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Now, over the next 30 minutes, we'll be listening to Dr. Sofia Kremidi from Athens. Sofia is a senior researcher at the Institute of Historical Research with considerable knowledge of Hellenistic and Roman provincial coinage with many papers on Macedonian coinage, numismatic circulation from site finds and coin hoards, and ancient economy. She will tell us to what extent the Wishonki coin collection has been important to understand the history of Macedonia and Thracia from the Roman invasion to the time of Augustus. So, Dr. Kremidi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Per Paolo. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction and thank very much uh, all, our, uh, all the, the organizers of this conference. I'm just trying to, to share my screen for a moment. Thank you. Yeah. Is that okay? Can you see that now? Yeah. Perfectly, perfectly. yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. So, um, this, is a, this is a general picture of uh, the material I was asked uh, to present in this, uh, in, in this conference. As you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, Macedonian and Thracian coins in the Wichonki collection, over 400 coins. Most of them are bronze, which is interesting. And the, the, the silver issues are, are fewer, and most of the bronze are Macedonian also. Fewer Thracian coins. Uh, apparently, Rick had a very specific interest in this, in this coinage, and I think we know why he had this interest. Um, I will intend to speak um, more about the bronzes because I think uh, they have been discussed less. A lot has been said and been written about these silver coinages. And if we have some time, I will make some references to the silver coins. If not, um, we will just, I will just leave that part for the, for the written uh, presentation. So, um, well, uh, there was quite an abrupt and violent transition in Macedonia after the Third Macedonian War, uh, when the the king the king of the the, Anti the last Antigonid King Perseus was uh, was led to to Italy in capture in Italy, and all the old um, aristocracy uh, that uh, had that, that had um, ruled the country was actually exiled with him. And there was a settlement, the, 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 the famous settlement of Amelius Pavlus in 167, immediately after the, the, Pivna, uh, the Battle of Pivna, which has been discussed a lot. But in what interests us here is particularly two clauses of this settlement. The first, uh, because it concerns coinage, the first is the division uh, of Macedonia as Libby states into four regions. The, the, the Romans, in order not to have um, a unified state that would be um, uh, dangerous to have uprisals and revolts, they decided to divide Macedonia and to give a lot of uh, political, uh, political power to the regional assemblies. Um, this is the first, uh, the, first, the first clause which is important for coinage. The, the second clause, is um, that that the mines of the royal lands should remain unexploited. This is something that has been connected to coinage, although um, we don't think today that it necessarily should have. Uh, so uh, this is a general picture of the bronzes that were struck 
in Macedonia during this period. So we have the coins of the questors in the names of the questors that have been struck um, probably on historical probability after 148, which was the, the, the date of the creation of the province. I need to say that we have an interval period from the Battle of Pisna to 148, where uh, Macedonia is sort of self-governed under Roman auspices, but is not turned into a Roman province. But after 148 and after some uprisals, the Romans understand that they cannot control this country, the country in this way. So they, still, they send a governor and they send uh, also a permanent army to deal with the problems in the region. So these quester coinages are probably dated immediately after the, um, uh, the creation of the province. And then we have the 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 issues of the of the of the of the of the three cities, which were actually capitals of the regions. Here we have a change in the way we have perceived these coinages over the last ten years. These coinages were supposed to be thought earlier to have been struck under the kings. Now I can't go into detail into this, but I will give all the bibliography for the written version. But now we are quite certain that this is a Roman, the coinage struck under, under, under the Romans. We have the fourth region coinage, which is a, a very enigmatic coinage, but there's none in the, in the Wichonki collection, rare coins, so we don't need to discuss those. And then uh, we have a very interesting Silenus issues. Uh, also belong to the time of the province. And, late, and finally, the first colonial issues of the late, late, uh, late first century, which are better known, I would say. So this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting uh, chart that shows on which we can speak about uh, continuity and change. Uh, these regions, uh, the, uh, that uh, the, Roman, um, the Roman settlement refers to existed before the Romans. This is often the case. They existed as administrative districts and they also struck, uh, they also struck coins under the kings. Um, so these here, you can see that the, uh, the, the, um, the third district equals to what uh, is the region of Otiea, um, and this is, the, this is the inscription on the coins, Makedon Voteaton. This is a monogram standing for Voteaton. Then we see that these coins are taken over by the questors, who also sign as with the name of the questor and the monogram Voteaton. And then we see that these same types are taken over by the cities, whose, the, the, the capitals of the, the, of the regions that strike under the Romans. So this is the case for the coins of the Boteate, the third region. This is the case for the coins of the Afaxians, which is actually the second region. And this is the case also for the coins of the Macedonians, which proved to be the coins of the first, through this, through, through this uh, development, through iconography that we see here, which actually proved to be the coins of the first region struck in Amphipolis. Now, Amphipolis was probably the main mint of the Macedonians. It was the city that was close to the, the mining area. So it was the most important mint. And uh, we see now, we understand through this, that probably the coins, the listed coins struck with, with, uh, inscribed with the name of the Macedonians only were, should be attributed to Amphipolis. So we see a continuity on the one hand of the iconography between the Hellenistic, the, the, the royal and the, and, and the Roman period. But uh, it's interesting to say that we also um, can, if we look at the other aspects of the coinage, we can also, we can um, see differences in the way, in the function of this coinage con con um, if compared to the coinage of the cities. And here we must say that the coinage of the cities is a very, very abundant coinage. And these are just a few of the types. I, I could not put all the types of the, of, the, of the cities here. It was no reason to do it. I just wanted to, to point out the, 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 the common types. So um, what, is, what is the same is that we have some continuity in iconography, as I mentioned, but what is different? is first of all, perhaps the way these coins circulated, because in a study that I, on the autonomous coinage that I, I published a couple of years ago, 
I realized that when looking at excavation coins that the coins of these regions have actually a rather regional circulation, which led me to believe that they could have been minted also um, at, at the, in these different places. Whereas the coins of the cities seem to have a more, a, a more, a more um, um, similar circulation within the whole of the, of the province, which is quite interesting. And also these cities uh, share the first issues at least, share common monograms, which shows a rather more centralized way uh, of, of production under Roman rule. So these are, um, these are the coins of what we consider to be uh, the, 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 the first quest that issued coins, uh, uh, Lucius Fulcinius. So uh, the legend is Macedonon uh, of the Macedonians, Tamiu Lefkiu Fulcinius, the quester Lucius Fulcinius. The legend refers to the Roman uh, magistrate, but it is in Greek and it seems to have a double identity for the issuing authority. On the one hand, the, the Macedonians, which should be the assembly of the Macedonians. On the other hand, the Roman quaestor. And there's a very good, as you can see, sample of these coins in the, in the Wichonki collection, because we all know that Rick was very interested in coins that um, directly refer to Roman magistrates. But the other innovative, of course, element of these issues is the head of Roma on the obverse. So this is the first time, this is a very obvious type, to begin a Roman period coinage. This is the second quaestor. Again, many, many coins, very many specimens of this, especially of this Athena cow type, which is a very, very common coin uh, in the Bichonki collection. You see here how this division is followed. We have uh, the, the large the, the denominations with the um, Macedonian inscription, and then we have the other denominations with the monogram alpha, alpha mi phi, which 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 refers to the Amphaxian region, and the beta taf, which re refers to the, um, uh, the the third region, the, the Moteate region. So we see that this uh, the continuity of this administrational system. Um, now, most of this coinage, this um, the, the, the coinage of the bronze coinage of the questors is very heavily overstruck. Many of these issues have overstrikes. And this is one um, in the in, in, in Wichoki's collection, this coin you can see here. Um, it, is, it is very obvious that there is an undertype under the reverse. So this is um, this is certainly uh, a head, a head of some uh, of some divinity. Um, now um, it's possible; it must be some earlier Macedonian issue, uh, from what we understand, also from other um, coins and other overstrikes, uh, which are very abundant in this in these coinages. Um, this is also a coin from Rick's collection. This is a coinage of the autonomous Macedonian period. Uh, the pre-Roman period, most probably. Uh, and uh, I think Rick acquired two of these coins exactly because he understood them as the undertype uh, for, the, for the Publilius uh, bronze. Um, however, it does a little bit puzzle me that all these issues are serrati, as you can see. They have these, these edges, these, they, are, they are struck on these very specific flans which is not the case, which is not obvious on the, on the, on, on the Questor coin. So I, I wonder whether if a coin like this was overstruck, if this would have completely disappeared. I mean, I, this puzzles me a little bit as to as whether this, we could, should not search a little bit more for uh, uh, perhaps for another undertype. I don't know. I tried to look for some other possible undertypes, you see they have this um, other Poseidon and, um, and club uh, issues of the Macedonians of the Amphipolis, but here the, the treatment of the hair is very different. So for the time, this seems to be the best explanation, but perhaps we will look into that a bit more. Now, uh, this is a very interesting uh, series of coins. 
which uh, definitely could be studied more. These are the uh, bronzes with the head of Silenus, the mask of Silenus, which was a, a companion of Dionysus on the obverse. And on the reverse, there is the ivy wreath, um, which is the, the, the Dionysus uh, symbol, and the inscription D Macedonon, D standing certainly for the Creto. So here we have an explicit reference to a decision of the Macedonian assembly to strike these coinages. But on the other hand, we also have, we don't have another name of a Roman, of a Roman uh, magistrate, but we have uh, this, this very peculiar Silanus type, which is not common for the Macedonian coins. It's, it's, uh, it's just on this issue. And it was, uh, it was uh, proposed by Gebler, who studied this coinage, uh, uh, that it could be um, a reference to Junius Silanus, who we know was Praetor in Macedonia in 142-141 BC. And uh, Gebler brought as an argument these later denarii, where we have another later Silanus, who uses the head, as you see here, the mask of Sil or, uh, Silenus, as a pan mark. It's a possible interpretation. It's a possible interpretation, but uh, it's not certain, of course. What is certain is that nobody has proposed a better one. Uh, what is certain is that these issues come after the issues of the questors that I presented before, because these issues are very, very often overstruck. And here you can see an example of uh, the undertype, which is probably a questor issue, although it could be something else. So what we certainly know is the relative sequence of the issues, but not the absolute date. Uh, this is another interesting coin because it's a bit of a mess. Um, there are clearly two types. There clearly uh, there is a clear a nova strike here. Uh, the one coin is this one, the coin of Wilkinius. You can see here the head of Roma, and Macedon and Tamiu here, which would uh, be the relevant to this. And here you can see on the uh, if we turn it around, you can see here the the the, the, the beard of Silenus and the, Mac the other Macedon inscription with a D, which is not very obvious, but in a good picture it's obvious. So here we have, again, an overstrike. I think Rick was a bit wrong about this. It's not, um, I, I don't know if it was Rick, but I think this is, um, uh, this must be the undertype and this must be the, the type on which the coin, this coin must have been struck on this coin and not the other way around, because this is the evidence we have from all the other material. Although this is the most obvious type here. A very interesting and unique, as far as I know, and I thank Lucia for pointing this out to me, um, overstrike of this um, uh, Silenus coins on, um, earlier, uh, on an earlier bronze and Amphipolis. And here again, we have through this overstrike, the confirmation of the, se the sequence of the, of the issues. You can see here om Omega Ni, and above here, there is an Omicron, certainly, and probably a P, but it's certainly not a Lambda, so it can be nothing else. And here, the traces of the oak wreath, and this Epsilon must be part of a monogram. So this is a coin of Silenus overstruck on a coin of Amphipolis. And this is, to my knowledge, the first, the first specimen I know of this overstrike. <clears throat> now, uh, if we turn to the, the bronze coinage of the cities, um, this is the general picture of the of the of the of the of the specimens in Rick's collection. As you can see, there's a very high concentration of coins of Thessaloniki, and especially of two types, or two few types that I will show you later on. Um, the, and uh, also quite a few um, specimens of the early of the coins of the early colonies. Here you. We need to stress out that Pella, that you see here, the Hellenistic Pella, uh, was uh, destroyed by an earthquake in the middle of the first century. And the Roman colony was actually, in this case, not built over the Hellenistic city, but it was built nearby. So there was a, there was a, uh, there was a movement of the, of the city, the, 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 because exactly the Hellenistic city was, um, was destroyed, so this has been attested uh, archaeologically. So the colony of Pell is not on the Hellenistic city. 
but it's nearby. And now these are some examples of um, what the, the first issues, the first issues of the cities from Rick's collection. And uh, it's interesting, you see what I also mentioned earlier, the three cities start their production with the type of, of Rome and an inscription in a reef. And uh, Rick has two, uh, two uh, the coins of Amphipolis and Thessaloniki, which shows exactly that we have um, an organized uh, central organization for these, uh, uh, for these, uh, for, the, for the striking of these issues. And then the other issues, they have um, the common monograms often. And you see that Rick um, chose the types with, uh, that either had a direct a reference to Rome through the type of Rome, or that these types were also found on the, type, on the coins of the questors. <clears throat> Uh, just a few examples from the Amphipolis coins. Uh, this we don't know when it dates to, but it must be a, probably a first century coin. It's interesting because it's one of the early uh, refer the, the reference to a Roman denomination. This is certainly an S for a semis. This is a small coin, it fits in well with this, to be a semis. It would be interesting to know when this, 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 this coin is, um, was minted because as far as we know so far, this transition from uh, Rome, from Greek to Roman denominations, happened in the second half of the of the first century, and these are the first Augustan um, issues of Amphipolis. Now, these are the coins for which uh, which Chunky collection has very many specimens. He has a special interest in these coins. Um, I, I, in the beginning, I thought perhaps he he wanted to accumulate them in order to for the Turatolus. Um, for the, the dissertation of Janis Turatul, who has written a corpus of this coinage, but apparently these coins were accumulated after, because the, the, this is an early dissertation, it was written in 1988, when about, I think, if I understand well, Rick started accumulating his coins, so perhaps he was intrigued by Janis' publication, and that's why he, he uh, was especially interested in these coins. Uh, which, uh, of course, from a historical point of view, are very interesting because they are a clear reference to the status of um, Thessaloniki as a free city by, um, uh, by Mark Antony, who stayed in the city for some time after the Battle of uh, Philippi in 42, because here you can see we have a pacification of, uh, um, of, the, of, of, of uh, eleftheria, freedom, so it's the freedom of the, Salon, of the, of the people of Thessaloniki and a, a, an epsilon, which is probably a, a date. So this would date to 37 BC on the, on the Antony era. Here, Agonothesia, meaning um, this is a personification of the uh, Agonothesia, it means um, to instigate new games. So this is probably, we have no other information on this, but probably games uh, for, the, for the victory at Philippi. And here, uh, uh, very explicitly uh, the name of Antonius uh, Caesar. And here again on the, uh, a similar coin, the small denomination, Omonoia between Thessaloniki and Rome. So, I mean, the city could not be more explicit in, in her fidelity and friendship to Rome. Uh, and these are also very many, very, very many of these specimens in Rick's collection. These are the first, first coins of Thessaloniki with the early Augustan, the early Augustan portraits, Julius Caesar on the obverse and their legend Theon Divus, and uh, the, the ethnic of the city with the portrait of Augustus on the reverse. And this is a second variation, uh, which, well, which this in RPC has been dated also to the time of Augustus. Uh, Janis Turatulu, however, in his thesis had, had considered these coins to be later. And, um, I don't know, honestly, I think he could have been right because the, the lettering is very different and the style is quite different, but we can't go into this now, really. So just a few examples uh, of coins from Pella. Um, you can see here the, the Hellenistic tradition still in these coins, which are after the Rome, after 148, probably second or the, uh, these must date roughly between the heart, uh, the, the, the middle of the second or the middle of the first century BC, whereas these coins, which are certainly 
um, the second half of the first century, you can see how these coins are, are more Roman in appearance. The, here is a clear reference. This is a colonial coin. This is a colonial coin. Uh, you can see that, and um, with a, the reference to Dumbiri, and probably is the first issue of the colony of Pella, with a very explicit reference to the um, the, the, um, the battle at Ac the naval battle at Actium, and representation of Augustus himself. And this is quite an interesting and puzzling issue because we have no other evidence. This, this is very reminiscent, of course, the coin of the Saloniki that I showed you before. This is also a large bronze that certainly is in, um, in accordance with the Roman denominations. Large bronzes like this did not exist in the Greek coinage earlier. So this is certainly shows that we have the transformation to the Roman denominational system. And it's the only evidence, if so, that there was some special relationship between Antony and Bella. Um, now, if we come to these um, early colonial issues, these are very well known issues, but very interesting, however, because they are very explicit um, mentions, uh, uh, depictions actually of what went on in uh, a colonial foundation, how a colony was founded. So we know that after the Battle of um, uh, Philippi, um, Mark Antony established some of his veterans in the area as the first foundation of the of, of Philippi and established the colony there. And here on the, on the large denomination, we have the plowing scene. On the second denomination, we have something which is more rare. We have this, um, this Roman legatus who, who is named Paquis Rufus, uh, Colonia de Duquende Legatus, he was uh, appointed to, to, to found the colony. He's the founder of the colony. And here we can see the, the process of the allotment of lands. This is the urn and he's, this is the process of allotment of lands. Here is another uh, smaller issue with the plow again, the symbol of the colony and the name of Rufus. So it's a very explicit reference to the early colonization of Philippi by Mark Antony. This is a very interesting from historical point of view series of, again, three denominations of the same period. Uh, we know, I, I wrote an article about this many years ago. Uh, this is a Quintus Hortensius Hortalus for whom we have inf information uh, from the sources. He was sent by Caesar as, uh, as, as, pro as proconsul to, to, to Macedonia in 44. He was sent out by Caesar just before his death. And then he came over to Macedonia and then we don't know really what he did there. But um, after the, when, when Brutus came over during, after the assassination of Caesar, uh, Hortensius took over the, the, the went to, over to the Republican side. And uh, then he was killed at the Battle of Philippi because apparently he had picked the wrong side. But um, uh, what these coins tell us is that we know from no other source that there was a colony that was, um, that was founded in Macedonia by Cotentius. Uh, doesn't name the colony. It has been assumed that because of this type, which is very common on the later coinage of the colony of Cassandrea, that this is a coinage of Cassandrea. However, many of these coins have been found at Dium as well. So there is a possibility that there was also a first uh, colonization of Dium by Hortensius, which is something interesting for which we have no other, um, no other information. And, uh, in, a, in, a better, in a better specimen, not this one, but on a, of this rare issue, we can see the, also the, the epithet Felix for Colonia uh, on the obverse of this, of this denomination, which is another, in my view, I mean, um, element that should connect this issue to Caesar. I believe that this was a foundation that was ordered by Caesar before when he sent Hortensius off to Macedonia and uh, was probably realized sometime after that, whether before or after Caesar's death, probably after he died. But uh, it must have been an, uh, an issue of his orders, the colonization, because we know that he had a very vast colonization program in the East. Uh, these are uh, some two, two specimens uh, in the Eric's collection from the Dium uh, colony. Now, these are included in, this, in his collection because he followed, uh, uh, he followed uh, Gebler and then Grant, who, well, Gebler considered these to be the, 
the first issues, the foundation issues of the colony and Grant um, uh, transferred them even earlier. He considered them to date in the 40s. Can't go into the details of this now, but we are now, it's now proven that these coins are second century AD coins. We have, um, uh, we have also hard evidence, very strong hard evidence. There's no doubt that these are not Augustan issues. Um, so a uh, couple of words also about Thrace. Uh, Thrace is very different to Macedonia. Thrace is a very different area. Uh, it has a very different uh, history um, because it was never a, a unified country. It was it always we had the, what we had was the Greek colonies around the coasts and then the Thracian tribes in the inland. So when the Romans take over, what they do is that all these the, 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 the cities, most of the cities on the on the Aegean coast that were controlled by the Antigonids and were quite suppressed by them actually uh, turn over to the Romans and they become friends of the Romans. And uh, then around 100 the Romans and uh, the, the Romans also control an area where they later on um, where they, they later on build the Ignatius Street. Uh, road, sorry, not street. Um, and then later on, after 100 BC and the expedition of Titus Didius, they managed to extend their control uh, down to Perinthos, uh, while, um, uh, and later on to the coast of the, of the Black Sea as well. And only in 46 AD does Thrace turn into a province. And what's very important to understand concerning uh, when we speak about the Thracians and the Romans is that um, there were two kinds of Thracians. <laughs> there were the Thracians basically of the, of, of the west part of, of what is today Bulgaria mostly, uh, which, were, uh, which were mostly hostile to the Romans. And they, uh, it was them together with the uh, Scythians and, and, and uh, Gauls that made all these inventions of the second and first century that the Romans had to repel. So they were in a constant war with the Romans, whereas the, the especially the Asti and the, um, uh, and the Sapaeans uh, were the friends of the Romans and they were their, their, their allies. Uh, and it was in the, the, the late first century that uh, they united to form what was called the client kingdom of Thrace, uh, which it was another way for the Romans to control the area before turning it into province through a very, very loyal ally. And there's a very interesting uh, book that's actually work that's being done by a colleague of mine, who is Maria Gabriela Parisakis, and we perhaps know her. She's actually working on a historical point of view, basically this client kingdom of Thrace. And there's a lot to be said, and I hope we're going to have a book uh, in the next years on this. Um, now, uh, I don't know, I just mentioned that I don't want to really go out of time, and, but I just need to mention that the cities continued to, uh, the, 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 the Thracian cities continued to, um, to strike coins under the Romans, but Crete only accumulated some coins of Perinthos because probably Perinthos was later turned into the capital of the province um, uh, of Thrace. So that's why his specific interest was there. And you see here, he, he chose an early coin to make the comparison with the later ones and their iconography. And the, uh, one unique and only coin of Byzantium uh, in Rick's collection, exactly, I think, because it copies a uh, type of the uh, denarius of Mark Antony. Uh, but a uh, large, important, not quite large and important number of coins of the uh, of the most uh, the most uh, loyal ally of Augustus and a close friend of his, Dimitarchis the first. Uh, who, who, who produced a very important and large numbers bronze coinage, which actually looks like provincial coinage very much, and it, what, which, what, what actually it was. And that's why it's also included in the RPC, as you can see here. Um, these coins were minted in large numbers. They circulated a lot and they circulated later and they were often countermarked also. And, uh, and uh, Evgeny Paunov, our Bulgarian colleague, has written 
um, uh, an interesting article about these coins lately. And you can see here uh, the, 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 the king with his wife and Augustus on the reverse. And there are four or five different denominations. This is just a sample. And this is a sample of the smaller denominations, which are very interesting from an iconographic point of view. Uh, these are supposed to be earlier than the coins with the portraits, uh, where you can see really Roman uh, symbols. You can see the Capricorn here, which is the symbol of Augustus, which is closely related to Augustus, the facius, and the Sela Corulis with the head of, uh, uh, with a, a female head on, uh, on, on top, which is a bit strange. Uh, this is a similar type without the head. And this is uh, probably an imitation because it has a, it has a, an inscription that really is illegible. So I'm quite sure that this is an imitation. So these are just a few examples of the Thracian coin, bronze coins in the um, in Rick's collection. And I think I would like to stop here unless you want me to continue because uh, I think, uh, well, I've said enough. I can put the, um, uh, some some comments on the silver in the in, in my written text. Okay, thank you very much, Sofia, uh, for your talk so detailed and deep survey about the Macedonian and Thracian coins. And once again, we could see how important and rich. Uh, the Greek collection is, and there is no doubt that he bought all he could and all he saw. And we can, we, we saw that many coins, very rare, very uh, spectacular coins um, can illustrate the history of this region. So I'm asking if there is any question. Yes, Sophia, but I know, I, I, thank you, Sophia, yeah. for okay. wonderful paper. Sorry, very bad, but as you know, we cannot, uh, um, I cannot type my question, the Q&A, since we are panelists. So okay. I, Sophia, thank you again and for this wonderful presentation. And I guess you are sort of expecting this question, but uh, so could you please uh, 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 repeat in some way? So then how do you see the, um, uh, the chronological succession then between given by given the overstrikes you already commented. So for you, what is then the relative? If you can repeat that again, yeah, uh, sure, sure, sure. Like, it's uh, like so the Amphipolitan and then the Silanus and the Questors, because I mean, of course, you know better than anybody else how it's a little bit complicated. Questor, I, yeah. it is exactly. Well, yeah, I understand it's a little bit well. Uh, how I understand how we understand things now is that mm -hmm. uh, we have under the kings mm -hmm. the coins of the regions. Okay, but they are Don yeah, yeah. Don, yeah, yeah. Uh, Although their dating is all, not always very obvious, but anyway, we consider now that these are coins, and then we we have the the coins of the first questors, which are Fulcinius and uh, Publius. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and after the coins of of, of uh, Fulcilius and Publicius, we have the coins of the three cities. Yes. So this is yeah. the, 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 the general succession. Mm -hmm. the yes. Now, the coins of Silenus, mm -hmm. uh, they come in somewhere in this, but we don't know exactly where they exactly. come in. Exactly, exactly, yes. And I think this is a very interesting coin, as you couldn't say, not, it's not been very, very much studied. I think that this coin, I'm not at all sure that Gabler's, Gabler is right with this, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, there's no indication, very firm indication of the coin. Of course, it's interesting because there is a praetor named Silanus. So it's certainly a possibility. But I, what I think we need to do is I, need, I think we need to look at the hoard evidence a bit more. Yes. Because I have the impression, first of all, this is a very abundant series. It could have been struck in a much larger period, I think because exactly there's so many of these coins. Yes. They're all over the place in the, in the excavations, there are very many. And I, and I think 
although I haven't looked at this into detail, but something we're looking at, I think that they are found in different coins than the other coins and than the other question coins. Okay, so this is so, uh, uh, the, the, so these coins come in sometimes uh, between the, the middle of the of the of the second and the middle of the first century, probably in the second century, I would say perhaps, but we really don't know where. Yeah, no, no, that's point. exactly what I was asking. Thank you. Yeah. So still, yeah. because, okay, so that's something you see, we need to see more because exactly, I think. Uh, and I think we can, we, uh, I think the only way to, 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 to know more of this, because we know, certainly know through the overstrikes that the Silanus coins are after the. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And they're after the Amphipolis coins also. So we're confirmed there with the, with the, with the sequence. But I think the only way to, to try to pin them down better is to look at the hordes, which nobody has done up to now. Okay, so we have, that's something we need to do. Fantastic. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. no, no, because exactly, as you know very well, we have at least, I think uh, he has four over strikes, exactly, the, the ones you're mentioning. Okay, yeah. anyway, thank you very much, Sofia. You're really. very welcome. You're very welcome, Lucia. More questions? No. Oh. Well, I think Lucia, the next um, speaker is. We have uh, we have some more. more time. I think we have another uh, uh, break, break, as far as I can tell, because uh, um, unless so you want to hear about the silver coins. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, to Can me. Can I show just a couple of slides if we have five yes, minutes? Please, please, yeah. please, okay. please do. Okay, because, yes. okay. okay. Just a moment. <laughs> and they're so beautiful, too. Right. Yeah, because I showed all the horrible blonde ones. <laughs> exactly. uh, I want just to make two points. I won't, I won't of course, uh, talk about all of them. I just want to, to make two points that perhaps are, are interesting. The first is, this is the, the large um, Macedon and Protis and the Fteris. Uh, well, uh, Francois talked about a lot about these uh, yesterday. But I want to point out uh, that there was actually um, a differentiation in the function of this coinage in the beginning and later on. I mean, because um, Group one of uh, Palnov, which is uh, of sorry Prokopov, which is certainly the earlier issues, are first small issues have different monograms and have a, a different uh, they have a different um, pattern of hoarding, because this is the um, uh, this is the map given by Prokopov in his book, and the uh, the early what is interesting is that the early coins are found around here, pro mostly in Macedonia proper, where all of the later coins are found in Thrace around the Danube and so uh, clearly we have a a, a, a coinage which, ha which has a more regular function before it turns afterwards and be used again. Perhaps this per I believe that perhaps the first issues could have been. Um, minted uh, after 160, between 168 and 148, 48, and the other ones after the province. Um, and the other point I want to make is I want to just point out a specific coin uh, because I have some questions about this. And, um, and now this is an, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a coin of Esilas. No, this is a coin. Uh, uh, just a moment. I'm... So this is a this is a, this is the, the, the these are the Esilas issues. They're very well known um, with the inscription with the head of Alexander inscription Macedonus on them, and uh, here is the reverse. And this specific coin here. Uh, was uh, is published in Bauslau as Group Two. Uh, with this obvious and reverse. And Baslo states that this is a coin overstruck on a Thasian tetradrachm, but I have some doubts about that. That's why I just wanted to show this. This is another example of a Thasian tetradrachm, which is overstruck on an Azilas. And this is clear here because you can see the Medicadonon. But uh, here, this coin, um, if we turn it around, um, we see that, uh, well, Boslo reads here uh, Irakleus, an alpha and a rho. 
I'm not at all sure that this is an alpha and a rho, but even if it's an alpha and a rho, there's a certainly an Omicron behind there. So I don't believe that this is a, I don't believe that he was right in, in in reading this overstrike as an overstrike on a facial coin. I think we must, we must look for something else, for another explanation of this overstrike. So I just wanted to mention this for, the, for your um, publication. Thank you. Okay. No much more, of course. <laughs> don't huh? worry, you will hear from me a lot. Ah, okay. <laughs> don't worry about it. Okay. But thank you. No, no, yes, you're okay. right. Yeah, I can see. I can see, I, yes, yes, because there is the lambda. Yes, I, I okay, I can see because I, I clearly see the lambda and the- Yeah, I don't think he's right there. Yeah, no, 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 I think, I think you're right there. Yes, yes, yeah. the other Tasos over Stracco over Resillas is absolutely beyond doubt. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, that's clear. That's very clear. But, but the other one, thing, yes, the under. We have to look for uh, another, um, another, another strike. Yeah, that should be yes, yes. T fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so no coffee break. No. We do have the coffee okay. break still because uh, Suzanne yeah. doesn't uh, begin until uh, eleven, right, Perepau? Okay, yes. Yeah. So because that... <laughs> no, we have, we resume at 11. Yes, we resume at 11, yes. Thank you so much, Sophia. Really, okay. again, and thank, thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.